Okay, I am going to go ahead and stop the poll so that we can get going. I think we've got got a, close to 90%. And I'm going to share the results. So you can see where we are and this will help me orient this talk. Um, a lot of you have a general interest in the medicinal herb industry and many of you are considering starting to grow. Um, and many, so it looks like quite a few have some experience with growing anyway, with farming. And about 30% of you are not a farmer. About 50% of you are new growers, but only a few of you have grown commercially before. And it looks like most of you are considering a small operation. Okay, that's really, really helpful to me. So I'm going to shut the poll and I'm going to go ahead and start the presentation. Okay, um, Hannah, say something if it's not showing. I'm seeing, looks like we've got the presentation all good. Go. So like I said in the, great, thanks, Anna. I'm gonna focus on what you need to know if you wanna be a commercial medicinal herb grower. And just for your information, that's California poppy on the left, echinacea, purple coneflower in the middle, and that is ginseng with my co-author, Scott Persons, on the right. So the demand for medicinal herbs is really growing. I tried to get 2019 figures for you, but most of the publications that I count on for that, that information usually comes out in June. And because of COVID, it's not available. So we're still dealing with the 2018 figures. Um, but you can see that there's still a very high demand for herbal supplements. We've got a strong growth. I know that the U.S. retail sales have topped $9 billion in 2019. And I think people are surprised to see what the number one selling herb in the United States is. It's whorehound. Think of all of those cough, dro cough drops we take. But in 2018, the number two um, herb, herbal supplement, medicinal herb, was echinacea, followed by elderberry, um, valerian, which is a, one that's very easy for us to grow in this state, is down around 19, still $17 million. And ginseng, which is one a lot of our mountain growers are interested in, is 23rd. So if there's all this demand for herbs, why don't we have thousands of acres of medicinal herbs growing in the Carolinas right now? Now that is echinacea that you see on the right in Avery County, and that is a small herb, small commercial herb operation, similar to what most of you are probably considering in Madison County on the left. Medicinal herbs are pretty easy to grow, and the market, market is huge, and U.S. manufacturers want to buy U.S. grown herbs. There's a lot of negative press right now on imported raw materials. So for all the safety factors and regulations and such, people want to buy from the U.S. But we haven't done a very good job in this country of filling that need. First of all, what I find is a lot of growers who are already established farmers who get into growing medicinal herbs do not give themselves enough time to learn how to grow it. They expect to make money with it from the first year, but growing medicinal herbs is very different from growing tomatoes or peppers or pumpkins, and you've got to give it a lot of time. You have to learn how to grow it well. Most of us, the first year we grow a crop like valerian, would not know what a quality valerian crop looks like. We want the roots, the roots smell like old socks that have been sitting in the hamper for two weeks. How do you judge the quality of that? When we first get started, we often don't have the equipment to do it very efficiently. So maybe we can do a quality crop, 
but it's going to take time for us to be able to afford the equipment to increase our yields and do it very efficiently. And probably most importantly is marketing medicinal herbs is probably different than any other market that you've dealt with. And it takes time to learn that. In reality, we do have a lot of competition from other parts of the United States that are ahead of us in this on doing it on a large scale. And I'm thinking of states like Iowa, some of the Dakotas for the echinaceas, parts of Texas. And of course, many other countries have gotten into medicinal herbs on a much larger scale, including India, parts of Asia, and parts of Europe, including Germany. So we've got to learn to do it just as good as they are doing it. But we do have medicinal herb farms in North Carolina. They're scattered all across the state from very small operations that might only be a half acre in size to some that are hundreds of acres in size. So let's take a look at a few of those. Pangea plants in Lake Lure, North Carolina. I was on a board meeting call with Gabe, the owner of this operation, just yesterday. He has done some interesting things. So he's in the foothills of North Carolina around the uh, Lake Lure area. And he is certified organic and certified biodynamic. So that gives him, he fills a very special niche within that market. He's also done a very good job of getting grants, which has helped him build up some of that infrastructure he needs. And he won an American Farm Bureau Best Farm Startup Award. All of these things have helped him grow that industry. Not to say he doesn't have challenges with COVID, but um, you know, he does have, you know, he, he's, you can see he's got a lot in production. Gaia Herbs is a large operation, more than $50 million company. They have a farm in Transylvania County and a processing facility. They've actually just built a warehouse directly across the street from the research station where I'm located. And this is part of their Transylvania farm that you see here. Um, so, you know, we've got a very large operation in the state. Then we have a teeny tiny permaculture operation. Um, some of you probably know Joe Hollis, a wealth of information. This man can tell us so much about Chinese herbs and native botanicals that we have. And he runs a very successful little operation. Gentle Harmony Farms um, by the Leonards are down in the Lexington area. They are a couple that really did their homework for many, many years before they got into operation. So they knew exactly what they wanted to do and what they needed to have and understood the market and started to build that before they got into operation. And they usually offer a couple classes during the year that you might want to check out. So I'm going to call all of these farms successful but they're each successful in their own way. And this is a really important point. They meet the expectations of their owners. So some people get into medicinal herbs thinking they're gonna make hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. And that could be possible, but you need to understand how to get there. Many of our medicinal herb growers in North Carolina aren't looking to make that kind of money. They're looking for a niche to fill, whether to diversify their own operations or to do something they love and to make enough money on it to justify doing it. Um, so have realistic expectations and be aware that COVID-19 has had both a positive and a negative effect on some of our herb farms. My point is that there are opportunities for grower and medicinal herbs if you're realistic about what you can grow and sell and on what scale. And I use the example here with some of our woodland botanicals. You have bloodroot in the top right, golden seal lower right, and that's golden seal growing um, on the left hand, lower left hand side. Those herbs are perennials that are going to take four, five, seven years before they're ready for harvest. 
So how does that fit into your planning? Also, you need to think, you know, why are you interested in growing medicinal herbs? Is this just something you really love to do? Is it a hobby that you're trying to make a little income on so you can make your hobby bigger? There's nothing wrong with that, but you know, that fits in a certain category. Is this something you want to be a big money maker with, you know, that you're going to need to borrow funds, that you're going to need a lot of land for, that you're going to need some well-established markets? Or are you just looking for a crop to help diversify what you're already growing on your farm? Maybe you need some other rotational crops. Maybe you see some other opportunities to sell to your markets. So I can't teach you how to grow all medicinal herbs in 60 minutes. So let's, let's just do a little bit of an overview here. I do wanna cover some of the basics and I do wanna cover some important issues that you might not have thought of in your planning so far. But first, let me introduce you to some of the more popular medicinal herbs that we can grow and I know have demand in North Carolina I expanded to include some that are gonna be in the more mountainous areas when I saw that we had people from all over the state joining us. And that's with ginseng. Now, if you're located in the Piedmont, this is not the ideal crop for you. But if you're in an area where ginseng can grow native, that people do wild harvest it, this is a crop to be considered. And there is a very, very strong effort right now on growing ginseng. It is our most popular forest botanical. It is threatened. There is a good market for it, but this is not something that you want to grow around, say, Winston-Salem on a commercial scale. You can do a few plants for your garden. Bloodroot has a wider range. So this, if you have wooded areas that have ferns and you've got things like jack in the pulpit and such, you can grow bloodroot. It's a beautiful plant. It has medicinal properties. It's used as a dye plant and it's also used as a landscape plant, um, you know, in wooded areas. So an important one to think of. Black cohosh will grow pretty much any wooded shaded areas in our mountains and our Piedmont it would be difficult to grow this in the coastal plain. Um, another beautiful plant and in high demand, but low prices. So that's one of those that didn't take that economics 101 about supply and demand. No matter how much the demand goes, we've really not seen the prices of this one increase yet. And I think a lot of that has to do with how much of this is still wild harvested. Echinacea is one that we can grow all over this state. There's three major species, the Echinacea purpurea, which you see there in the upper right, um, and Gustafolia, which is in good demand, but more difficult to grow. But interestingly, some of the best production I've ever had was in the Reedsville area. And then Echinacea pallida, which is not so much in demand, but um, more so as an ornamental than as a medicinal. California poppy um, is one of increasing popularity and used in many tea blends. It's got a mild sedative effect. This is one where you really need to understand what your market wants because some markets just want the top of the plant with those flowers at a very specific phase and others want the whole plant, roots and tops and flowers. So you need to understand what they want. And I wanted to include one of our herbal weeds. Yes, there is a market for plants such as dandelion and stinging nettle. So this is something else that you might wanna look into. And interestingly, dandelion is not as easy to grow as a crop as it seems to grow where you don't want it to grow. And here is the stinging nettle. There is a very good market for stinging nettle. So now let's look at what are kind of the general considerations to grow these herbs. No matter what kind of herbs you're growing, whether it's in the woods or an open field site, 
and that is St. John's wort that you see in the upper right. Site selection is very important. For all of these herbs, you want good soil, good air movement, well-drained soil, you want good quality water and low weed pressure. Back in the early 2000s, I did a medicinal herbs for co commerce project across the state, working with 50 tobacco farmers to grow medicinal herbs. And somehow many of them got it in their mind that these herbs would grow on fields where nothing else would grow. I don't know where they got this in their minds, but it really didn't work. You need to pick a good location anytime you want to grow a crop. You need to determine what scale of production you want to be on. Do you just want to have a quarter acre of one herb, like lavender, for example? Do you want to have a, a half acre and concentrate on five or six different herbs? Or are you looking to produce 10, 20, 30 acres of herbs. All of the good basic agricultural practices that you should be aware of or your extension agents would be happy to teach you to grow crops apply for medicinal herbs. So you're going to want to take soil samples and have those analyzed to find out if you're short in basic nutrients or you need to adjust your pH, soil pH. You're going to want to do a root knot nematode assay because that will affect many of these herbs. You're going to want to understand good weed control. Are you going to use herbicides or cover crops or cultivation? And probably the most difficult is disease, insect, and critter management because we do not have the control products or the research out there to help us with these medicinal herbs as much as we do with our major crops. So this is something you're going to want to keep a close eye on and be prepared for. Buying your seeds and planting stock is a very critical step and not where you want to be cheap. Do not buy your seeds off eBay. Go to companies that have a reputation for producing medicinal herbs and stand behind their products. And these are just some examples of companies that I have worked with over the years um, that I know produce quality plants and seed stock. Um, there are some good nurseries around, like Red Root Natives uh, up in the mountains here that produces very good quality plants. She's a former extension agent. With medicinal herbs, it is critical that those plants be properly identified. Many of these plants look very similar. Black cohosh and yellow cohosh, it's very difficult for most of us to tell them apart just by looking at them. One is a medicinal herb and the other is not. A point that a number of growers, particularly of perennial plants, seem to wait too long to figure out is how they're going to handle harvesting and post-harvest handling. So if you're growing, this is golden seal that you see on the right hand side, a perennial plant long before you need to harvest, you need to have an area that you can do practice harvests, practice cleaning on, because this can be a big deal. If you've got an acre of an herb to handle, say you have California poppy to be harvested at a certain stage of bloom, you're going to have to do that quickly. So how are you going to accomplish that? Be prepared. There is equipment that is designed specifically for small and medium scale farms. Uh, and that top right there, you've got Gabe at Pangea Plants demonstrating one of his leafy green type harvesters. And he's got some videos on his website, I believe, that shows that in operation. Um, it really, it cost him some money, set him back a, back a bit, but I think it's paid for itself very quickly. What kind of tools are you going to use to help dig up those root crops? I promise you, you aren't going to want to do a half acre of digging roots just using a pitchfork or a shovel. And then how are you going to clean those herbs? In the upper right, you see someone using a high pressure hose to wash echinacea. A lot of people start that way. 
you aren't going to do any kind of volume of herbs and roots that way. Roots are really dirty. You need an efficient way to get those clean that isn't going to run your well dry. So on the upper left, you see a cement mixer, a plastic tub one that is very easy to clean. Remember, these herbs are consumed by humans or pets. So they have to be as clean as you would want any of your food to be. We have found that doing a couple of rinses first in a cement mixer gets rid of that tumbling action, gets rid of a lot of that dirt that's in there. Then we can put it out on screens and give it a rinse over with a high pressure hose. In the lower right, you see a very large scale root washer and that was from Herb Farm out in Oregon. Most of your herbs are going to be sold dry to your manufacturer. We do have some buyers that will take some fresh herb, particularly for homeopathic remedies, but most of them are going to want those dried. And most all of us underestimate the drying space we need. This is where it would help to talk to some other growers to get some idea of how much space you need, how much you can harvest at a time and work through your drying operation. We do have some information on dryers available online at my website at ncherb.org. Um, tobacco barns, that's that middle picture there. We're actually in the process of converting two tobacco barns into herb dryers, hemp dryers right now. The top picture is taking a standard utility building and turning it into a dryer. And in the bottom is a very simple box that has a piece of um, baseboard heat and a fan. And that's, you know, you need good airflow is the primary thing you need and low temperatures. You don't want high temperatures. You don't want to cook these herbs because then you will degrade the medicinal components. And then you need to package into food grade containers. Um, so this is not where you use black trash bags or, you know, kitchen garbage bags. You want food grade packaging, which is readily available, but, you know, you need to go buy that ahead of time because you aren't going to run into Walmart and find it. Um, we've also worked with some companies to take some of the tobacco equipment and help us bale up some herbs. So that lower right hand picture is using a tobacco baler and that baled up echinacea. Keeping good records throughout the process is critical. If you're a certified organic grower um, or you're somebody that follows GAPS and has your GAPS certification, you're already very familiar with this. If you're not, you need to write down everything from where you got your seeds um, to everything you applied to those plants, where they were planted so you could trace back to that field site if needed and you need to retain samples in case anyone ever needs to come back and check on something. And labeling is very important. Your labels should have the common name and the botanical name, a lot number, and where it was produced and a way to reach you. And then when we talk about medicinal herbs, much like when we talk about hemp, we talk about COAs, Certificates of Analysis. So if you're selling on any kind of scale at all, your herbs are going to go to a lab to be analyzed. And you could have this done or the buyer could have this done. And sometimes you do both because otherwise you're just trusting your buyer to be using a reputable lab and you know, giving you a good test. But this is just an example of showing you some of the things that'll be on there, including moisture levels, ashing, which is looking at the amount of dirt that's in that sample, microbial analysis, there's often now pesticides and heavy metals. And some of them, depending on the herb, will have active constituents that are measured. GAPs, which are good agricultural practices, and GMPs, good manufacturing practices, also apply to medicinal herbs as they do for most of the crops that we consume. And what I remind people of is when you're done cleaning these roots, 
Is this something that you would give to your young son or daughter to eat? Is it clean enough? Do you feel good enough to give it to them to munch on like a carrot? So good agricultural practices for medicinal herbs right now are suggested, but not currently mandated. However, many of your buyers will insist upon these. There must be proper identification. Um, they need to meet the specifications that you agreed on. They should be free of any and all contaminants, which include if say, for example, you're harvesting dandelion and there was a little stinging nettle in there, even though that's a medicinal herb, if you have a dandelion crop, that stinging nettle would be a contaminant. Um, you need to practice good post-harvest handling and storage and label everything. Now the good manufacturing practices do not apply directly to the grower, but they will affect whether you can sell to a manufacturer or not. These are instituted by the Food and Drug Administration and you can look these up, just look for the herbal supplements, good manufacturing practices, and the manufacturers have to abide by this. So they have to be able to verify the identity of all ingredients. You can help that by either having a lab analysis done on the product you're supplying or providing a botanical voucher. Um, and you can also make sure that everything is clean and meets everything that they need to meet their regulations. This is a complicated topic. A lot of information, we could do a whole two hour session on this. I suggest that you take a look at either the good agricultural and collection practices that the American Herbal Products Association has on their website at AHPA, APA, we call it, .org, and that, that's a membership organization, but that document is open to everyone. It is a big fat document, so I have condensed it into one that is more applicable to our growers, and that's on our extension website. And then we also have to pay attention to the Food Safety and Modernization Act, and any of, the, you, of you that grow produce right now are very familiar with this. And this also will apply to our medicinal herbs because we do consume them. So again, you need to make sure you can meet all the regulations. And what you see on the left, many of our medicinal herb growers are organic producers and like to have integrated operations. So letting chickens run around to clean off bugs within their production systems is something attractive to them, but would not be allowed within a crop that's ready to be harvested. This picture I believe is an after harvest picture, um, so that's okay, but there are certain practices that you might be used to doing that now with FSMA would not be allowed. And we do have a food safety regional agent, Elena Rogers, who is very up on FSMA as they relate to medicinal herbs. So to recap, good agricultural practices are voluntary guidelines that apply to you. But if you don't follow them, you might not be able to sell to certain um, buyers. Manufacturers are the ones that have to follow the good manufacturing practices but because of what's expected of them, if your product can meet what they meet, need, you know, that could help you out. We can expect that federal regulations for growers will be developed sometime in the near future. So you know, I just tell everyone, especially if you're just getting started, grow your medicinal herbs as if it were any other fruit or vegetable and meet all those same kind of food safety guidelines. Then we get into marketing. And many growers think this part will be easy, but oftentimes it's not. So you need to think ahead. How do you want to sell your products? Who do you want to sell them to? How much time do you want to spend on marketing? 
there are so many different ways to do this and different income potential. Um, this is Lori Burra on the bottom right, who is a medicinal herb and hemp grower up here in the mountain region where I'm located in. And she does kind of a seed to shelf type operation where she sells some of her products wholesale, but she also manufactures many of her own products. So when I talk to large farmers who maybe are right now growing wholesale tomatoes or peppers or their tobacco grower, they often think of getting into herbs and doing wholesale. And there's nothing wrong with that at all. Um, we're fortunate we have some of the best wholesale medicinal herb buyers in the country are located in North Carolina, and I can help make those connections for you. What you need to understand is these, grow, these buyers are selling into the big manufacturers, they have very high standards, and they also need large volumes. So sometimes this is not the place to start. Think of 500 pounds or more of an herb would be needed for them. So we call these buyers dealers, raw botanical suppliers, or consolidators, because most manufacturers do not buy direct from the growers. They go to one of these consolidators and they say, I want one ton of this herb and 500 pounds of this herb and 1,000 pounds of this herb. So it's an easy way to go if you don't like to spend a lot of time marketing but you need to have the volumes and the prices per pound are gonna be low as they are in any wholesale market. One way to explore wholesale buyers is to go back to this American Herbal Products Association website. Their member directory is also open to the public. So you can go through there and find out, you know, who do I have in my area or maybe looking for things that I'm interested in, in growing. It's really important to build a relationship with your wholesale buyer. This project I mentioned to you with these 50 tobacco growers, some of them were very successful. Others fell apart a bit because they did not keep their buyers informed. So if they started having problems in the middle of the growing season, they should call their buyer and go, whoa, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to give you a thousand pounds of dandelion this year. Um, we had a flooding incident. I might be down 25%. That allows that buyer to try to fill in that gap. Those are two buyers there on the left, Ed Fletcher and uh, Jackie Greenfield. They are both independent buyers um, that are still working the industry. As I said, most manufacturers don't buy directly from growers, but a few of them do. And I highlight three here in North Carolina because they represent three very different scales. Uh, Gaia Herbs, as I've mentioned, in Transylvania County, they are a big grower themselves, but they also buy on volume. So if you can produce 200 pounds or more of a certified organic herb, high quality, Gaia might be a good market for you. Red Moon Herbs run by Jeannie Dunn is a small scale manufacturer that's been in business for a long time. She loves to support new growers, um, small scale producers. She will buy five to 20 pounds. She's looking for a certain quality, would very much prefer organic, but she'll work with you to help get you where she'd like to see you be. And then Dr. King's makes homeopathic remedies. So because of homeopathy needing a very small amount of the product um, in a large volume of water, they buy in like one to five pounds. So we've had some growers do very well with Dr. King's. You need to remember that this raw bulk medicinal herb market is very vol vol volatile. So I always suggest having several different herbs in production, have several different markets, and have other income streams to rely on. Because, for example, you might start growing golden seal this year in 2020 because you hear there's a huge market demand, but your crop might not be ready till 2025 and 
you know, who knows at that point in time, um, the market might not be so good. So, you know, pay attention to that. You can sell directly to herbalists, herb schools, natural health care practitioners within your community. Many of them like to know their grower. They like to be able to come out and actually see the plant they're going to be using as medicine growing in the field. That's Corey Pine Shane on the right hand side with some of his class coming out to a grower's field to inspect things in production. You might want to sell directly to retailers in your area. Um, if you can package up your herbs, you see there on the right hand side, all of those herbs in those brown paper bags with the plastic windows. You know, those could be tea blends or individual herbs. If you have independent retailers, you might be able to work out a good relationship with them. Or you can make and sell your own value added products. Now, if you're into soaps and most lotions and body care products, there aren't very many regulations on you at the present time. If you're making something that is to be ingested, you're going to fall under a lot of the same food product rules and regulations. So you'd have to be in a certified kitchen. And you can find this out from your state and county rules. Don't rule out things like agritourism and educational events. Uh, you might have herbalists in your area that would like to pay to come out to your farm and do a workshop or a plant walk. If you're real knowledgeable about these herbs and you want to do small scale production, maybe you could offer some workshops. You know, charge $70 for an afternoon to come to your farm to learn all about lavender, learn how to make a lavender wand, have a lunch with, you know, lavender tea and lavender in your cookies. You, you can do the whole thing. You now see medicinal herbs being sold at our farmers markets. This wasn't true 10, 15 years ago, but now our average consumer is knowledgeable enough about these herbs that you can sell these products or even the raw materials and kits for them to make their own extracts and tinctures along with your other products. There is a shortage of planting material. So not only home gardeners looking for these herbs to grow, but even for our big scale producers, there are not enough nurseries out there providing these plants. So you might want to be a nursery to do this. You can incorporate medicinal herbs into your CSA. As I said, as the, these have become more popular and our consumers are more knowledgeable, they're making their own teas, they're making their own tinctures. And of course you have to have an online presence and some of our herb growers sell only online. It is very, very simple now to build a website or a blog. You can add a payment system such as PayPal or Square. Um, and what's going to really drive traffic to your site, of course, is providing good quality information, maybe some videos, maybe offering some webinars. If that sounds like too much work or not something you're willing to take on, there are existing portals that you can use. Uh, you can sell in local food guides up here in the mountains. We have the ASAP local food guide that you could be listed on. There's a lot of herbs and seeds and plants. I told you not to buy your seeds and plants on eBay, but that could be a place for you to sell them. And you see there's some good prices there. And the local harvest is a national local food guide that now is a place to advertise your farm for people to come visit products that you sell and you can actually have a little storefront there when you get into medicinal herbs you need to understand that this is a new business like any other business and it could take three to five years or more for you to um, make a profit on it so have that in the back of your mind. You know, it's like, don't quit the day job right away. 
do the two together as you build this new medicinal herb business. So a big question is, how much do I charge for my product? A lot of people will go around to stores and see what those products sell for. That's a way to get you an idea of what the market might be willing to bear. But I'll bet you, you're going to have so much hand labor in your products initially. Your products are going to be very special. And for you to make any money, if your time is worth anything, you're going to have to charge more. So how do you show that value in your product? How do you get your customers to understand? And that's Gabe again on the right hand side showing how he is garbling some of his, um, his herbs all by hand. So one good way to get some idea of what prices are going for, what your competition is going to be, some market ideas, is to at least once in your career, you need to attend one of the big natural products shows. This is the Natural Products Expo West. Um, it went virtual this year. There's Natural Products Expo West. There's an Expo East. There's a supply side West and East. Those are the four biggest shows. It costs a fair amount of money to attend one of these, but wear your best walking shoes and expect to just be blown away at the tens of thousands of vendors that will be present there and all the ideas you'll get and all the connections that you can make. You'll be able to talk to buyers and growers and see all kinds of products and there's usually an educational component that goes on. So I strongly recommend you do this at least once and many businesses as they grow will do one of these shows a year and have their own display or a group of people can get together and have an association or some kind of marketing group that goes ahead and has a display there. So can you really make a profit growing medicinal herbs? Yes, you can. A lot of people don't, but I think it's because they didn't treat it like a real business. You have to write a business plan. What do you want to do? How much of a profit do you want to make? You know, is this something that you've got a hobby of growing herbs and that hobby costs you three, four thousand dollars a year and you just want to make that back so your hobby kind of pays for itself? Nothing wrong with that. That's a good plan. But is this something that you want to bring ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars a year into your income stream? Then you're going to have to treat it like a true business and do your whole market analysis, your timelines, your budgets, financials and there's so much help with our, our communities to do that. I also suggest that you visit some successful herb farms around the state. This is a great thing to do this year as we're all social distancing because you're going to be outside. Uh, many of these farms welcome visitors. I hope many of them are charging for you to come visit or you should offer to pay a consulting fee if they don't know that. So you're showing that, that you value their time. Some of them will have you come and work in exchange for information. We just had this discussion on a Zoom call the other day that someone was like, I'd love for you two to come visit my farm. And while you're here, you can help me reglaze this one um, high tunnel that I have. So visit them, find out what they're doing, what works, what not. If they had to do it all over again, what would they do differently? And this is a good first start for you to attend this webinar today, but I urge you to attend every relevant conference, workshop, and event that you possibly can. And we're in such a great situation right now that so many people are taking things online there's stuff available to us now from across the country that you know we probably never could have thought of attending before. And for a few hundred dollars, you can get all the information that before would have cost you thousands with airfare and 
hotels and food and everything involved. The people I know that have been most successful, the vast majority did their homework for several years. They were interns on someone's farm. They came to our events. They volunteered uh, for farms and in our program to learn everything they could. And build those networks. Um, we have a little group here in Western North Carolina called the Western Medicinal Herb, Western North Carolina Medicinal Herb Growers. And it was started by several extension agents along with my research associate, Margaret Bloomquist. And it has really evolved into a great networking and training tool. And members of that group will come out and they'll help in our gardens and demonstration and research plots and learn through that. And then they work with each other, hold educational events, and now they're planning a marketing event. So start small and keep really good records. As I said already, don't quit the day job. Be honest with yourself about what you want to do. You know, how big a business, how much time can you realistically devote to this? Just think of how much time your vegetable garden takes. You know, what is it gonna take for you to do medicinal herbs? And then every year, conduct a review and be brutally honest with yourself and your partner, your spouse, your family, what made money and what didn't. You might really, really love California poppy, but if it's not profitable, quit growing it commercially. You can always have some for your own use, but be brutally honest about what you have been able to find markets for and what grows well on your farm. Survey your customers. What would they like to have from you? What do you, or, or differently, is there a way that you could provide that herb, package that herb, different package sizes that they would like to see? And are you taking care of yourself and your family? How many hours a day, a week, a month are you putting into this? Can you keep doing that? Um, be, be, be realistic. So many people don't think about the additional labor that, they're on their, that they need on that farm. You need to plan ahead for that. And many people think they're gonna get interns. Our farm interns nowadays are different from the ones we had a decade ago. A decade ago, we'd get an intern that would come and work on your farm all summer long so you could train that person up and that person could stand at the market while you were at a different market but what we found is there's a change and a lot of our interns want to get more different experience so they might come to your farm for four weeks and then move someplace else then you're stuck finding somebody else to come in and take their place and retraining them so have that in your your planning and be sure to have a business professional help you analyze what you're doing on the financial level. There's some great resources out there for us. If you're interested in anything coming out of the forest, we have a project that is a partnership. It's led by Virginia Tech University. Um, we're partners on it and we've got a bunch of nonprofits engaged and it's the Appalachian Beginning Forest Farmer Coalition. And even if you aren't going to do things like ginseng or golden seal or ramps or something like that, a lot of what is in our videos would be helpful to you to understanding how to run an herb business. So this is AppalachianForestFarmers.org. Um, you don't have to be a member anymore to access all of the resources, so please check that out. And then there's my website, uh, ncherb.org. We've got a lot of herb information on that. And if you sign up at the bottom of this page, if you would go ahead and learn more, you can sign up to get our news updates. And I promise we won't swamp your inbox. Um, we don't have time to do that, but that would keep you aware of important information or any meetings or conferences coming up that you would wanna know about. 
And then there's some great books out there. Probably the top book I would recommend to you is the one on the left, The Organic Medicinal Herb Farmer by Jeff and Melanie Carpenter. I was very fortunate to, to get to review this book for them before it came out, and it's wonderful. I do hope they revise it soon. There's a couple little sections I would love to see them expand on. The book on the far right is by Richard Wiswell. I've heard him speak a couple times. It's really related to running any kind of small farm business and it's wonderful and I highly recommend it. It comes with spreadsheets. It will really help you learn how to keep those records and determine what makes a profit for you or not. He'll even tell, he even tells you how to organize your desk. And then if you're interested in doing the Woodland Botanicals, the book that I co-wrote with Scott Persons for commercial producers is probably still the best one we have on the market because it does put so much emphasis on what you need to do to make this a profitable business. And with that, I'm going to stop the share screen. Wow, pretty much on time there. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. So, um, so we're going to move into a question and answer time. Um, we've been really looking forward to having a robust um, question and answer portion after the presentation. And we're lucky to have Janine here. Um, so if you'll just put those questions in the chat, I think with this many people on the call, it's probably better than having people on mute, right, Janine? Yeah, so what we can do, since I don't see anything in the chat so far, is if you go ahead and write them, I'll try to keep up with them. And Hannah and uh, Ellie and Mary Jack can help me with that. And, you know, it, you can even just write question and then we can call on you and we can have a bit of a discussion. Oftentimes the questions, okay, there we've got one right there. Michael, why don't you go ahead and um, unmute yourself and ask your question? Hi, thank you, Janine. Um... That was a great presentation. I, I'm just wondering, you know, <laughs> when you said it, it may take several years until a profit is realized, um, I'm just wondering, A, like, if that has truth to it in general, um, how many hours a week, if someone is consistently growing over those years, can someone reasonably expect to invest um, in an operation just hours-wise? Um, I guess I, that would depend on the size of the operation, but just a range if, if one comes to mind. And, so, uh, mm -hmm. okay. and the, part, the part B was the, um, from all your years, I mean, have you noticed some commonalities um, for the, the farmers, the growers that, that realize a profit, say, by year two or three, if that's even possible? Is it that they they did like hardcore research and found the best possible land and they chose, you know, all the herbs that grow within a year. And is that, you know, I guess any factors that didn't come up in your presentation? Sure. So I do know people that have made money their first year. You can, you can do it. In the most case, those were people that were very small scale. So they, you know, they grew something like lavender there was going to be a big festival in their area that they were able to take that lavender to and they sold out right away. The growers that really need to take the time to learn, and I'm going to use a specific example. When Jackie Greenfield worked, when she was the buyer for Gaia Herbs, she told growers, and she had worked with established farmers only, it was, you need to give it three years. That first year you're going to grow it, you're gonna be learning it. I'm gonna be out there helping you all the time. And what you produce is probably not gonna be the quality that I need. Um, you know, there's gonna be problems with it because you just don't know how to grow valerian that first year. The second, you know, she'd buy a little bit of it, but not very much and you probably wouldn't have very much. By year two, the two of you are starting to really understand each other and she would buy more from you. And by year three, if you'd really paid attention and worked closely together, you should be getting there, you know, where you would be making a profit and going, all right, next year I need to buy 
a cultivating implement that'll allow me to put my rows closer together. But what we found is so many of our farmers were not willing to give it two or three years. If they didn't make money that first year, they were like, ah, that doesn't work. So that's why I push on that point so very, very hard. But if you've got a unique little little niche, you know, you, you can make that, make that work for the first year. Just, you know, don't expect to make tens of thousands of dollars. And the time and the, investment? The time investment, um, on a small scale, think of what it takes you to do your vegetable garden. A lot of people, when they first start, this is what they do after work. Okay, they go work, you know, eight to five, and then they come home and they work on their herb operation and they do it on the weekends. And it can be exhausting at first, so it really helps if another family member or a friend is in it with you, so it's not just, just you. Um, but you can do this part-time. And then what I've seen a lot of people do is they start out and they do that, you know, they're putting 20 hours a week in it initially. And then as the business starts to grow, it, it starts to just become overwhelming. And I've seen many of them cut back on the day job. They'll go to three quarter time, you know, enough to keep their benefits going, but give them more time. And I've watched some of them eventually turn that business into, that's what they do full time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so a and bunch of questions came in after that. Yeah, Janine, the next question is, um, what are good herbs to grow in the coastal area, Wilmington and C specifically? So none of those woodland herbs, for some reason, so many people in the coastal plain want to grow ginseng and just, just forget herbs like that. But you can grow valerian, echinacea, um, dandelion, you know, there's a whole bunch of the sun-loving herbs that need a well-drained soil Everybody that you can go ahead. Herb garden. You've got I'm it. Sorry, as a, if, Robin, if you'll, if you'll mute yourself while Janine's answering. So, um, you know, there's quite a few you can grow. And remember when I talked about going to visit people, if you could go visit um, Shelton Herb Farm, now she doesn't, she does some medicinal herbs. She's mostly an herb nursery and does a lot of fresh culinary herbs. But Shelton Herb Farm in Leland is, and she sells a lot in the Wilmington area. She's, um, I don't know if she's still a master gardener, but she was for many, many years. She is so knowledgeable. If you're close enough to go spend an afternoon with Meg, it'd be well worth it. Even if you just say, you know, how much do I, can I pay you to just follow you around for a day on the farm? Because you would learn lots. Um, are there any grants assistance for new farmers in North Carolina? This kind of depends on where you're located at. For example, in Western North Carolina, we have the WNC Ag Options Grants. In more of the center of the state, we have the RAFI grants, which are very similar. The program called SARE, which is the Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education, does farmer grants that we've been very successful in North Carolina with our farmers being able to get some of these grants. That grower I kept talking about, Gabe, I think Gabe must spend his evenings on the computer computer looking for grant opportunities because most of his equipment that he has on his farm he got grants to help him do uh, but I would suggest that you start first by talking to your own extension agent uh, maybe some of your uh, soil and water people and find out what's available in your area Janine if I can um, jump in on that of course in, in the Forsyth and uh, Surrey and Yadkin area, it's going to be Ag Ventures, which is like our NC options, but it's called Ag Ventures. And usually that grant come, is advertised in November and usually due in January. And plan ahead of time. Do not wait until the week before it's due to put it in. 
it's the kind of thing that you go talk to your extension agent about now and be already fleshing it out. Okay, Robin. Yeah, had a I have one other thing to add. A lot of counties have um, economic development commissions and they often have um, small grant programs that farmers are often eligible for. So definitely talk or look to your EDC. Um, and again, talk to your extension agent. If you're in the Ag Ventures area, we have that in Wilkes and Ash and Allegheny as well. Um, talk to your extension agent because um, you need to work with them for the WNC Ag Options and the Ag Ventures programs. We're very fortunate in North Carolina. We have more grants available to our small farmers than I hear in a lot of other states. Okay, Robin, you said you had a question. Oh, uh, yes. Um, I live in Wilkes, but I live at the base of, um, I'm like maybe 15 minutes from Stone Mountain at the base of Ash Allegheny and um, Surrey County Mountains where they combine. And I have uh, about 20 acres and up in the woods, there's a lot of that echinacea, I mean, not ginseng and bloodroot. Mm -hmm. And so is it possible for a person just to go up there and get that and not have a like like just do like small scale is that on your land yes if it's on your land you can harvest off your own land there's still regulations with some of these plants that you need to abide by and what we encourage instead of just wild harvesting that you manage those populations. So for example, if you have black cohosh, that you just don't go harvest all the black cohosh, but we teach you how to harvest some and propagate the rest so you'll have more and more to harvest in coming years. So that Appalachian Beginning Forest Farmer Coalition is exactly for you. Okay, you need to go to that website. You need Thank to you. look for the upcoming events because we do have them around your area. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, then we have Angie. Can you offer suggestions of where we can look for grants to apply for to establish infrastructure and build cleaning equipment, buildings, etc.? My mic isn't working. <laughs> sure. Uh, so I think we've already answered a lot of that. Your best bet, Angie, is to start with your extension agent to find what's available. And if I didn't mention it already, look for foundations. Um, some of our growers and some of our little nonprofits have just done an amazing job finding foundations associated with like breweries and um, some of these energy food bars and certain organic companies offer these small grants to help people grow and you know they're just not widely advertised you just got to go search for them benjamin says i would think that being in wilmington you could grow some venus fly traps i know it's not an herb really but there's a market for it and that's the local area where they grow naturally and Benjamin, good point, but that's one where you need to read all the rules and regulations because there are some associated with Venus fly traps, just like there are with ginseng. Um, whenever we get into the native plants, particularly in the woods and with Venus fly traps, you need to make sure that you're following all the native plant rules. So you go to the North Carolina Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services Plant Protection Division, and you read to see what the status of that plant is and what the rules are. So I think for Venus flytraps that you have to have a nursery permit. I'm not absolutely positively sure because I'm way outside of that area, but I think that you have to have some kind of permit. And with many of these plants, if you grow them, you're also going to have to have your nursery license, which isn't a big deal, but just something to be aware of. Okay, and Brian, let's see, that was going back to... Uh, Brian, yeah, we've got a lot of stuff up in the Asheville area, um, you know, especially WNC Ag Options grants. 
are the ones that people have been really successful with in our region, work with your extension agent. We've done well with those. Um, Michael, you've got another question? Yeah, so, so I, I, I practice with herbs right now in my profession. I'm considering going into a, a longer program. If I'm at a stage where I'm really giving this a lot of thought and I'm wondering whether I should give this a chance career path-wise, I mean, is there, rather than taking events here and there, and if, I, if I'm not really at a, at a point in my time-wise to go dedicate a, a couple months or, or a year working on an actual uh, farm that has herbs, what, um, is there some sort of commercial uh, growth like multi-week series or two, three month online program just to really flesh out in my mind whether this is something I wanna dedicate my life to because I, I really care for herbs, I care for people. And I'm just wondering if I should, um, you know, as an herbalist go into this. So to do one commercially, you know, there is a program out there for lavender which I was engaged in that I would rate about a seven on a scale of one to 10 that's being offered out of Michigan State University. But I would consider, now she doesn't really focus on the commercial scale, although we've talked about doing it for years and just haven't made happen. But are you familiar with Julia Blankenspore and Chestnut no. Herb School? No. Look up Chestnut. She has a total online course. First of all, you're going to be blown away by this woman's photography and videography. Um, she's, she's amazing. She did focus on growing for a small-scale herbalist scale. That's what she is. So it wouldn't be like large-scale production where you would need a bunch of tractors and stuff, although I believe she takes you out to Gaia Herb Farm for one of the visits. But go ahead and take a look at her program. Okay, that's Julia Blankenspore with Chestnut Herb School in the Asheville area. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, oh, well, Marta, thank you very much. Do we have any other questions? How about from our extension agents? Um, I just wanted to share with Michael to kind of address your time question earlier. Also, just from my experience, um, herb, herb production it, uh, requires almost as much time in the processing part as it does in the growing part, depending on your equipment. And so, um, you know, I think it's a valuable experience for you if you're interested or considering to try maybe growing one crop and taking it through that whole um, cycle of growing it, harvesting and processing. And um, you get a sense of what the rhythm is and the time requirements and you know what equipment you might need to invest in in the future. Um, I think some of the larger pieces of equipment that um, can make your operation a lot more efficient are um, what <laughs> can sometimes make it hard to sort of make money uh, back quickly because you might be investing a bit in equipment to, to uh, promote efficiency um, and it'll take a little while to pay for those things. That's just my personal experience, um, Michael, but just thought I'd share that. Thank you. And really good points, Ellie. Uh, that's, as I mentioned in that one slide, we had a bunch of growers producing golden seal and these few others. And one grower in particular, and I'm not going to point out, I actually had a picture of him in there. Um, he grew beautiful golden seal for five years. And Gaia Herbs, he contacted Gaia and Gaia said, yes, we want to buy it. We'd like to have it by such and such a date. It was like two weeks away. And he wasn't prepared. He had not done any practice on digging, washing, drying, and he actually lost that market window. He could not get it done in time. 
he, you know, it was a hard lesson for him to learn. He did fine after that, but yeah, you need to, to figure in what the time it's going to take to do the rest of that. Um, there was a question from Brian about whether you can hire me as a consultant. Um, that doesn't work in state. I'm here paid by the state to do this job, just like your extension agents are. However, you can't have hours and hours and hours of my time because that just doesn't exist. But that's why we started the WNC Medicinal Herb Growers. So I suggest you look at that page on my website and also look, we've got a Facebook page. And that actually developed as a way to start meeting that need. And my research associate, Margaret, who is a trained herbalist, is the person in my program who really has taken the lead on that. And I think that meets a lot of that. Now, if you have some specific questions that you want to arrange a couple hours to meet with us, you know, we can definitely do that. But yeah, you know, even out of state, I don't have time to, to do consulting work. Just my job consumes me. Um, Mary Jack asks, can you tell us what basic equipment one needs to begin? If you're doing real small scale, I would suggest that you have something like a BCS walk behind tractor with some attachments so that you can till that soil, so you can, you know, do some cultivating with it, so that you have like a, um, I'm drawing a blank, sickle bar type mower so that you could like go through and cut your echinacea you know, at ground level. I think that would be something really important to have. Um, you're going to need a way to wash. So some kind of tumbling washer, uh, you know, look for a root washer or the cement mixer is, is probably a minimum. And having some way to dry. If you could go and visit Gentle Harmony Farm around Lexington, go to their website and find out what they're offering this year, see if they're doing any kind of field day, just being able to see what Charles and Pam have done at that farm is really, really valuable. So, Wild Herb Weekend. Kim mentioned Wild Herb Weekend, which was supposed to have been this past weekend. Uh, that is put on by the North Carolina Herb Association. It's held in Valley Cruces every year, except this year. So we did have to cancel. Um, we had our annual member meeting, very poorly attended on, by Zoom yesterday. But we are going to have it next year, July 23rd to 25th at the Valley Cruces Conference Center, just outside of Boone. And what we're going to do this year instead is a number of our speakers are going to go ahead and do webinars for us. They will be for pay. We feel very bad that these speakers have not, you know, we weren't able to pay them as we anticipated. So go to that website. Uh, go to their Facebook page. The website is not being kept as current as it should be, but go to the North Carolina Herb Association Facebook page and you will find that information. Um, so we've got Wild Herb Weekend, other ones for these commercial type events. There's a lot for herbalists, not so much for the growers. Most of the grower type events are associated with, for example, Carolina Farm Stewardship Sustainable Agriculture Conference. Several times now we have done an intensive the Friday before. The last one we did was two or three years ago. It was wonderful. Um, so watch for those. We will usually tie in with some other kind of growing event, Organic Grower School, Carolina Farm Stewardship, the Vegetable Growers Association. Um, the North Carolina Herb Association, not enough commercial growers have stayed actively engaged for us to make that work. Yolanda asks, do you recommend dehydrators small in the home? If you're thought, talking about those tabletop models like the round ones um, or even the small stainless steel ones, 
those do a very, very small volume of herbs. Probably the minimum size you're going to want is going to be like a 10 by 10 foot building. Many people will go and take and close off a small room in their barn and put in a dehumidifier and often an air conditioner. And sometimes that will do it. They don't even have to do the heat to draw that air out or that moisture out of those herbs. Um, but the dehydrating can, can, be, can be a problem. Others have an attic area that works out real well. Uh, Lori Burra, whose picture I showed you, I believe in the beginning she just took a room in her house and worked with that. Now I'm telling you, if you've got central air, your house can get quite aromatic. Sometimes that's good and sometimes not so much. Hannah asks, are there any herb crops that are more regulated or require a license to grow like industrial hemp? Uh, um, Hannah, not that I can think of. Hemp is the only one that needs a license. However, you know, with ginseng, there's, you don't need any kind of license to grow ginseng. But if then, say your buyer for ginseng was in Virginia, you would have to be a licensed dealer to be able to sell that ginseng to somebody in Virginia whenever you do that interstate commerce. Um, if you are a nursery producer, if you were selling ginseng seedlings to somebody to plant out, which I don't know why we don't have more people being a nursery for woodland botanicals, because woodland botanicals are really hot right now then you would have to have your nursery license. But like I said, you need to watch to make sure that you're not choosing to grow something that is an endangered species on the state or federal level because there then would be regulations there. And I just want to ask a question for, for one of my growers. Um, when you're selling herbs directly to the public, do you need to have any sort of medical or herbalist license or be careful to enjoy avoid charges of practicing medicine i guess yeah very good question gosh darn i really should have that in the presentation <laughs> um you can't give medical advice so that's where you've got to be really careful and so if you're selling those herbs what i do and i'll do this a lot in my presentations for example if i was selling echinacea like you can make a little kit um you could have echinacea root and you could have bottles and you could have filter paper and you could have instructions on how to make your own echinacea tinctures and all people would have to do is swing by the abc store and pick up some alcohol okay cute little kits kind of thing if i were selling that and somebody asked me you know i've got this problem how do i use this all i would say is this is how I use it, but you really need to talk to a clinical herbalist on the proper way to use this. You know, I make it very, very clear. I am considered an herbalist because I grow herbs, but I am not an herbalist that can give you any advice, and I wouldn't. You know, Ellie, I might tell you, yeah, I take echinacea if I think I've been exposed to the cold and the flu. But I'll just tell you what I personally do. I would never say, you're coming down with a cold, Ellie, you should take some of this. Because that there you have crossed that line. Very good question, Hannah. And make sure that you don't ever say this is going to cure cancer or COVID or, or anything like that. Any other questions Great or question. comments? Should we do that second poll? Yeah, let's do that. Okay, let's go ahead. We've got one more poll. Poll number two. So if you liked this, we can do more, but we'd <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
everything lights up. <laughs> And Hannah's going to then share with us what is available afterwards with this. I'm actually going to let Mary Jack uh, she close this out. Okay, great. Wow, we did really good staying on time. What a team. And once the world is a little bit back to whatever our new normal is going to be. I, whenever we're holding events and field days of which we love to do, all the extension agents will know of it. We can get the information out to you again when you could come out and spend a day with us and, you know, we harvest herbs and we just go through the whole process. Okay, I'm going to give it 30 more seconds. Lisa, good comment. We can do a whole business of herbs um, one, and that wouldn't be hard to do because we've offered that session before, um, as I said, in that intensive at the Carolina Farm Stewardship Conference. We've got some growers. That's where I bring in different growers to help share so you get some real world uh, advice. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and end the polling and show you the results. So because so many of you want to learn about specific medicinal herb crops, I'm going to ask our agents who are involved in setting this up. Um, we'll work together to come up with a list so we can get an idea of what kind of things you're looking for. And uh, I think it would be a lot of fun for us to bring a grower on. So depending on what you pick, we can kind of team teach it. That would be a lot of fun. Okay, Mary Jack. Great, thank you so much, Janine. That was just a fantastic presentation. And thank you um, to everybody who attended today. Um, we are very fortunate to have Janine as our extension specialist with specialty crops, herbs being some of those specialty crops. And um, as I can tell by all the interest, people attending and good questions, there's uh, just lots of opportunities here for learning and growing and growing this industry. So um, we will be very interested to um, continue the conversation with everyone. You are gonna receive an evaluation by email and um, it, you'll also have a copy of the recording and Janine's presentation. Um, so look for that in your email. We'd also love to know if, if you have uh, even beyond Janine's poll, if there are specific herbs that you are particularly interested in, if you'll respond, um, you know, when you send back the, uh, well, the email, will act, excuse me, the evaluation is actually an online form, but you can respond to the email if there's specific crops that you're interested in. Um, and we're also, um, I know that there's that wonderful Western North Carolina Herb Club, and so those of us that are in the Piedmont are, are wondering if folks are interested in a Piedmont edition of that herb club. So if you have an interest in that, if you will certainly let us know and you can respond to the email um, that you get with the evaluation and, and let us know whether you're interested or not. So um, anything else for the good of the poll there, Janine? Have I covered it? So I suggest, just based on some of the comments, you all take a look at the website for Sunshine Lavender Farm. And that farm is one, is one of the very first small herb farms with incredible marketing. And I remember when I first met Annie Baggett, who runs that farm, and she now is the NCDA agritourism specialist. But just check out what she has, and I didn't go to look to see what, what um, opportunity she has to visit but just her website alone will give you some ideas. She's just focused on lavender. She picked one crop 
you could do that with anything else. You could be Sunshine Rosemary Farm. <laughs> but a good idea of what somebody did on a very, very small plot of land. And there certainly is a lot of interest in the public in, uh, you know, finding out more about herbs and having opportunities to visit farms and purchase fresh herbs, uh, you know, as plants and also, um, you know, for eating. And to do stuff. They love to come to yeah. your place and make something, you know, come there for a day and have an experience, drink some herb tea, um, you know, I did a workshop a few years ago making botanical prints. And we all collected stuff and we hammered them onto fabric and, you know, just, just things that don't take a lot of time or money on your part to do, but people love these experiences. So great. Well, thank you all so much for joining us today and um, stay tuned for some more information and classes on herbs. Great. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Janine.